Karen's Hill at the Rock Island County Health Department. It's 3.30 p.m. on August 6th. Today we have with us Nita Ludwig of the Rock Island County Health Department, Ed Rivers of the Scott County Health Department, and Ann McNellis. She is the Clinical Director of Transi Transitions Mental Health Services based in Moline. Um, media partners, if you believe that you cannot turn a story today, um, we would urge you to look at this information that Ann is giving today for a future story. It is excellent tip-based information about how to deal with stress during the pandemic, and every single one of us are dealing with that. Other coalition partners, we would urge you to uh, post it on your website and your uh, personal Facebook pages. This really is information that we all need. Thank you very much. Nita, let's start off with the Rock Island County's numbers. Good afternoon. Unfortunately, today, Rock Island County Health Department is reporting a death of a man in his 70s from COVID-19. He had been isolating at home. We are sad to report that another person has died in Rock Island from COVID-19. We understand that everyone is tired of COVID-19, but it's not going away anytime soon. Please continue to reduce the spread of the virus by staying home as much as possible, washing your hands frequently, and socially distancing, and wearing a face covering when you must go out. In addition, we also have 14 new cases of COVID-19 to report today, and that brings our total to 1,693. Currently, there are 17 patients hospitalized with COVID-19 in Rock Island County, and our death toll now, the total for Rock Island County is 34. Thank you. In Scott County, total number of cases is 1,643. And unfortunately, two additional deaths of Scott County residents have been reported by the Iowa Department of Public Health. One individual was in the older adult age group, 61 to 80, and the other in the middle age group, 41 to 60. We share our deepest sympathies with the family and friends of these individuals. We must work together to slow the spread of this virus and to protect the health of all in our community. We ask all residents to play their part by wearing a face covering when in public and keeping physical distance from others, ensuring at least six feet between yourself and others outside your household. We know this pandemic continues to take a toll on our community. A prolonged pandemic affects not only the vitality and economic stability of a community, but the mental health of its residents as well. We appreciate having one of our many partners from the mental health field here today to address this very issue. Thank you, Ed and Nita. And again, today we do have Ann McNellis from Transitions Mental Health Services here with us today. And as we had asked her to discuss um, with all of you the impacts that we're seeing in mental health related to this type of a prolonged um, event, we had some questions that we provided to her that we were hoping she could answer. And so we're actually going to do it in a question and answer format just to help get some of this information out there. Um, so Anne, perhaps you can first explain to us, I know uh, Transitions Mental Health Services is a member of the QC Behavioral Health Coalition. Um, can you describe the coalition and its role in the community? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on the call today. Um, the Quad City Behavioral Health Coalition is a collective alliance of area organizations, professionals, and providers who are working collaboratively and across sectors to really advance the mental and behavioral health of residents in the Quad Cities. Um, we have four collective goals that we are working on collaboratively together. Those are to promote mental health awareness throughout the Quad City area, to drive innovative programming and initiatives, to measure our progress and showcase our results in the community, and to identify and pursue any new resources for behavioral health services in the Quad Cities. This coalition represents um, over 50 area behavioral health organizations, hospitals, social service providers, uh, school systems, university systems, and governmental entities. So it's wide reaching and um, we really hope to do fantastic work in the community and we are pushing forward with that. 
So how has your organization and other partners really responded to changes in delivery services as well as demands that you're seeing related to COVID? Yeah, well, in mid-March, um, very quickly, we shifted the majority of our mental health services to virtual mental health options. So that included telehealth, uh, video interaction, and phone sessions. Um, many of our partner agencies in the state of Illinois, as well as across the nation, also moved their services to what we refer to as remote services. Um, so that included our counseling, our therapy services, and our psychiatric services, which all became pretty adaptable to doing via video calls and phone calls. Um, and in the event where clients did not have access to computers or internet or app devices, we've continued our engagement with them through phone sessions mainly. Um, we have seen a steady stream in, of clients that have continued to engage in our services during this pandemic. Um, however, we've certainly seen some challenges, particularly posed to client families with children that were really trying to juggle their work demands with online schooling, whereas previously we were providing those services in many of our area schools. Um, much like many other businesses, our agency has followed protocols to implement a smaller workforce on site, a staggered workforce, so as to be able to implement the social distancing rules, um, while also keeping our office locations open to the public. Our staff wear masks at work, and when people from the public enter the building, we do require them to wear masks. We ask them to follow social distancing, and we also assess for uh, exposure risks. Now, in some cases, we have had clients that have really appreciated the telehealth delivery of services and have expressed a desire to continue that telehealth method um, post-COVID times. But we've also seen a lot of COVID fatigue with many other clients who wish to really return to that in-person social connection. And we miss our clientele. We miss that social contact as well. We really understand the pros and cons of delivering services this way, um, but we have to continue to attend to the Illinois governor's phase restrictions while also carefully weighing the county's growth rate of cases too. So what can you tell us about the type of toll a prolonged event like the pandemic have on mental health? So the, the ongoing uncertainty of a worldwide pandemic really brings some significant life changes and just unprecedented stressors. You know, these long periods of quarantining and social distancing compounded with the fear of contracting the illness, all of the economic uncertainty, including higher unemployment rates that we're seeing, these all have a direct negative impact to our mental health. We also must consider the compounding um, stress um, that's going on as, as a result of the, um, the socially strife times that we're living in with right now. We are experiencing an epidemic of racial injustices occurring across our nation. And these events together create a heightened, acute, and prolonged stress reaction, which activates our fight, flight, freeze response in our bodies. And this prolonged activation actually can wreak havoc. This bodily system can wreak havoc if it's activated for too long on our sleep, our mood, our appetite, our behavior, and our overall physical wellness. Um, I really think many of us can relate to the more vulnerable ways that we coped in the beginning of the shutdown. There was this disruption to work and home life structure. And as we had to rapidly shift to school closures and new routines, some of us delved a lot into too much media exposure. Uh, we turned to comfort eating. We dropped off in our exercise. Our sleep got disrupted. We may have been experiencing more emotional mood swings, increased anxiety, that feeling of being very emotionally isolated from others. Um, maybe even some increase in negative thoughts and worries, and also that feeling of very, being very internally tuned into what was going on and what is going on. Um, so the more recent data that's coming out is showing that the impact on Americans' mental health is that we are really increasing in stress-related disorders. 
the John Hopkins University uh, did a survey and released it just this past June that both anxiety and depression have more than tripled during the pandemic. And the biggest prevalence that we are seeing of mental health problems is among young adults between the ages of 18 to 29 years old. So there was a jump from 3.4% in April of 2018 to a whopping 24% of that age range that were reporting psych psychological distress this past April. I also wanna to touch upon those populations that are particularly at risk lower income households, those who posed vulnerable mental health risks prior to COVID-19, those who live in poverty, people of color, those in domestic violence situations, those who have been unemployed consecutively for many months are at a particular risk for depression and stress-related mental health and physical health conditions, and including substance abuse. So according to, I'm gonna share some stats at this point, according to a recent report from the APA, the American Psychological Association, it's titled Stress in America 2020. The economy is now a significant source of stress for over 70% of Americans. And that figure really rivals what we saw in the 2008 Great Recession. The federal government's response to our current crises is also causing stress to over 67% of Americans. More than one third of Americans have displayed clinical signs of anxiety, depression, or both since the pandemic began. And for those that were experiencing and are experiencing financial difficulties, that figure rises to as high as 55%. Only 50 percent of Americans actually feel comfortable and safe discussing mental health issues and seeking mental health help through their employment. There's a fear of retaliation, a fear of being fired for seeking mental health treatment. It's a significant concern in our U.S. workforce. One in five Americans have had a physical reaction when thinking about the pandemic. So stress and anxiety often manifest itself in physical symptoms within our body. The Federal Disaster Distress Hotline, which is run by SAMHSA Department, a federal department, reported an increase in a thousand more text messages in April compared to approximately 1,700 in April of 2019. So a phenomenal increase. And the research tells us that long-term psychological consequences of collective trauma can last a decade or more. So now um, you've it, you know, explained um, the stress that can be caused as a result of this. What are some tips to ease stress ways that we can kind of use this and be resilient and move mm -hmm. forward as a result? Yeah, let's talk about being resilient. Let's talk about Empowerment, what can we do? The biggest, best tip I can give anyone, no matter your age, your status, or your roles in life, is to really set a goal of staying regulated. What I mean by that is self-regulation is the practice of managing one's thoughts, one's emotions and behaviors, while still keeping in mind and pursuing longer term goals. It is really a critical skill for professionals, leaders, and parents. And as adults, it's a truly important skill for us to develop in our children. Stressful times really call on us to tap into our resilience and self-regulation is a cornerstone of resilience. So the following tools I'm gonna to share with you were adapted from Dr. Bruce Perry's Neurosequential Network Model of Resilience. The first one is to build structure into your day really aim to keep and continue a routine, especially during times that are unpredictable. Having predictable daily routines, expectations and boundaries around meals, bedtimes, chores, work, exercise, play, it really allows for us to tolerate stress more effectively. And it actually calms both our brain and our body and helps us to regulate our emotions. Number two, have family meal times. This is such a great way to create or preserve structure or routine, especially for our kids. 
we can socially connect around food. We can make a point to check in on our days, share stories and laugh. Social connections release particular endorphins in our brains that really help to calm and bring happiness to our bodies. Number three is to, as best as possible, really limit our social media time. Um, today's media really has a way of quickly activating that stress response in our body and causing dysregulation in our mood. I don't know if you've ever noticed or have been noticing that as soon as you get on, you jump on news media or social media, do you notice a rise in your anxiety or tension or fear? Well, we're seeing more and more fear-based news, more and more violence and negativity, and that sends our brain into, and that of our children's, into the primitive part of our brain. And that part is responsible for anxiety, aggression, anger, and fear. So really practicing that self-awareness when we're on media and really noticing our bodily reaction to media and making it a point to try and limit our time and our children's time on this tool. And instead look for opportunities to create more playtime, exercise, and creativity. That's number four, that's tool number four. Let's get our bodies moving and our kids' bodies moving while we're also practicing the physical distancing. So as I said before, we're living in a time when we are more in a heightened state of arousal. Um, and the only way to really actually move out of that anxious, fearful driven state is to engage in activities that really require meditative breathing and or patterned rhythmic activity and moving. What I'm talking about here is um, walking, running, dancing, singing, yoga, meditation. For kids, it can look like swinging on a swing, riding a bike, jumping rope, playing a musical instrument, um, engaging in creative activities, coloring, knitting, crafts. All of these rhythmic activities have a way of calming the super anxious states in a, the primitive part of our brain so that we can be less aroused, we can move into a more cooperative and relationally oriented state and way of behaving. So if you can remember this from that, from that point itself, activity and creativity is the bomb for anxious brains and bodies. And number five is reaching out. The most powerful buffer in times of stress and distress is our social connectedness. So let's really prioritize emotionally connecting while physically distancing. Reach out and connect. And if you are struggling to do this, reach out for professional help to get that support from us. Number six is helping others. And there are really so many in our community who are experiencing adversity um, currently, and they're really in a state of vulnerability right now. So reaching out to help others, especially if you come from a place of privilege. We have a wonderfully robust service-oriented community, and we have social justice organizations that are growing and are really trying to address the inequities in our communities and across the nation. And when we step outside of ourselves and help others in need, we not only help our health and healing, we really are investing in building a stronger and a healthier community. Number seven is to really practice good sleep hygiene. Now, I think many of us have had a lot of disrupted sleep during this pandemic, whether it means having difficulty falling asleep or sleeping longer or not enough. That heightened state of arousal that I talked about is creating that disruption. So really try to incorporate exercise into your day at an ideal time, while also practicing calming activities at night. Try to avoid late night eating or media, uh, practice mindfulness techniques to help you fall asleep, listen to calm, repetitive, rhythmic sounds on an app device to help induce that relaxation in the brain. And number eight, the final tip, is to stay positive and stay future focused. So when we stay calm and regulated, 
there's really a contagion effect. Those around us feel less stressed. So practice healthy boundaries. There's that saying, fill your cup. Fill your cup with creativity, with movement, with laughter and humor, with social connectedness, read and write. Remember also though, to be gentle with yourself. Practice self-compassion during these times. Realize we won't be as productive as we once were. And this isn't really such a bad thing. We are living in trying and unprecedented times and we need to be kind to others as well as to ourselves. Our mental health and our well-being truly depends on it. So um, he mentioned a number of symptoms related to stress and anxiety connected to this. How should a person know if they've reached a point where they could use some services or what, what should trigger that in their mm -hmm. minds that it might be a good time to talk to someone? Yeah, well, if you're struggling with those tips that I just went over more days than not, if you find yourself really struggling to function day to day and follow through on your day to day responsibilities, um, if you find your mood or your anxiety levels really impact how impacting you relationally, how you behave, or, or it's creating an inability to follow through on responsibilities. Um, if you find yourself socially isolating and finding yourself really experiencing some negative, dark, very hopeless thoughts, those are all signs that you could be experiencing a heightened mental health issue. And it's really okay to call and inquire about help, even if you're not sure if you need it. Mental health services are private, they're confidential, and they're voluntary. So if you even question whether or not what you're feeling and experiencing is truly a mental health issue, give us a call, give a local mental health provider a call, and get the, that confidential feedback and, um, and really get connected socially to start beginning to feel better and moving towards recovery. Now, if you don't have insurance or if you are experiencing um, issues with being able to access mental health services because of uh, finances or insurances, there are a number of funding sources in the community that are available to us local mental health providers, and we can use those funds to assist those who are underinsured or uninsured. So those local mental health providers have that information to access those funds when someone calls for help. And Anne, we have one last question for you that we have prepared. Um, what can the community do to support mental health now and beyond the pandemic? Well, I would really love to see the community collectively join in the fight against mental health um, stigma by creating opportunities within their organizations and their businesses, their schools and their systems to openly talk about the importance of mental health, openly talk about it as part of our overall health and well-being. We really need to align the discussion about wellness with mental health. They co-join. And we need to do that not only at home and in our personal lives, we need to do it in our places of business. And we need to promote both mental health and health collectively. We need to encourage businesses to incorporate wellness topics in their orientations and in their trainings. We need to train leadership in all systems to really recognize mental health issues and particularly recognize signs of depression in their employees, um, recognize signs of suicide, and what resources that are available for their employees and their families. Our community really needs to commit to addressing trauma on all levels that are impacting our children, our families, and our adults. This pandemic really provides um, an opportunity for an even greater conversation and understanding of collective trauma and trauma's impact to highly vulnerable populations. By becoming a more trauma-informed community and system, we really can directly help heal the collective traumatic burden that we are experiencing. And lastly, I just think this is a time for innovative thinking and partnerships and new initiatives to be birthed. We will see the impact of this pandemic and social injustices for decades to come. And I really feel strongly we must invest 
as a Quad City community in collective healing, not for one aspect of our community, but for all of us. A truly healthy community is one that's invested in health and healing for every individual. And again, thank you so much for the opportunity to share all of this information with you today. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, I am going to go to the chat here. It looks like we have one question, and then another one is a follow-up on providing some of the links, which maybe we can work with you to include um, later on in our press release, which will have a, most of this information, but we'll also connect you to that. Um, have you seen any increases in people who have mental health issues ending up in emergency rooms, interactions with law enforcement, or increased needs related to homelessness? And that might be just some anecdotal information that you have. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, from what we have seen within our organization, we have where we have seen some increases in uh, domestic violence situations and we have seen a particular challenge around being able to assist uh, a, a person within a domestic violence situation to getting them to a safe place because uh, movement obviously is, is restricted. Uh, there, there have been times where apartments just have not been available to try and move them. Um, so that is one area in which we have seen some increases. Um, we have uh, thankfully, because there's been a moratorium on um, rent being due, we have uh, we have seen less stress around that, although we have, with this mounting um, pressure from clients that have maybe missed their, their rent because of unemployment in the last few months, we have been able to access local funds that have assisted us in paying emergency rent and um, uh, bills that have accumulated due to utilities in particular. Uh, because I don't work in the emergency room, I can't really speak to that in particular. Well, thank you. Um, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions. Oh, there's one that more that popped in. So we'll go to that before we end things. What are some of the things people talk about when they come in? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think if anything, we are collectively experiencing the same stressors that our clients are experiencing and talking about. Um, I think originally we saw some clients not necessarily engaging in the very beginning because they thought this was something that was going to be short-lived. Uh, but as time has moved on, we've seen re-engagement with some of those clients. And um, they are talking about a lot of stress and anxiety they are talking about the, the uh, tensions in the community around um, those that wear masks, the, those that don't wear masks. Um, interestingly, those clients that have uh, really struggled with obsessive compulsive types of symptoms have, I think, felt very validated in some ways by the level of um, attention that now everyone collectively has to take to taking care of their health and germs, et cetera. Um, the, the social isolating piece is something that many of our clientele uh, who fall prone to because it's a symptom of depression in particular and anxiety have felt very validated by the fact that collectively as communities, we've all had to socially isolate. Um, so that has provided some validation in their experience in kind of an interesting way um, and, and provided some um, really good processing and conversation. Um, I also think that it has elevated the discussion around the importance of social connectedness. When we can't have it, um, we begin to appreciate it. And, um, and again, we've got many clients who are, who are experiencing that COVID fatigue and really missing that connection with us and being able to see us in person. And, and we are too. Okay, we have one last question, then we'll conclude. Um, how can we help people feel like they are not alone? Hmm. I think, um, you know, unsolicited contact with others, asking them how they're feeling, reaching out to those that you have the ability to reach out to, um, and ask more than the surface level, how are you? Um, you know, really dig a little bit deeper and say, 
what does your day-to-day -day life look like? How are you struggling with things? And actually also normalizing that struggle, you know, say, saying me too, you know, I'm struggling with those things too. And boy, yeah, I feel that fatigue or, or I'm really missing those connections as well. When we can normalize that and make that a thing that we can all connect on, um, people don't feel so alone and they feel understood and um, it feels a little more normal. And I think there is a normalcy to this that we're all experiencing. And, and so when we can connect on that, I think it, um, it becomes a, a healing tool for us. Well, I'm happy to so provide, much. sorry, I'm happy to provide the links to the research as well that I shared uh, during our call today. Okay, we will try to get that from you um, before we send out the press release. So to the media on the call, we'll work on that. Um, thank you again, Anne, for joining us and for this great information. We are recording this briefing and it will be posted on the Scott County Health Department's website if you do need to catch anything that you may have missed at the beginning or throughout. Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we appreciate this and we'll be in touch with further information. Have a good afternoon. Thanks everyone, thank you.